All right, Joel Gostin here from joelgostin.com. For this conversation, I am bringing back a recent guest. Uh, we covered quite a bit the last time, but there's some additional stuff we wanted to dive into. So without further delay, it's my pleasure to welcome back my old friend and sometimes bandmate, Mr. Sal Canzaneri. Sal, good to see you, man, as always. All right, nice seeing you again. So... The topic is my fistful comps, but the roots of that go way back to the early 90s when MP3s were developed. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is a cool idea. I mean, you know, it's still new, still don't understand it too much, but I could see how, oh, then all these programs came up suddenly that you can convert your CDs to MP3. So I'm like, okay, um, did that. And then I discovered mp3.com. And then I found all the other bands that were interested in the same style, right? Same roots, the punk rock, hard rock mixture. And there was bands all over the world and all over the United States. Um, after I got in, people would tell other people, oh, you should go there. Because, you know, there's all these big discussion groups. And what, what they did was they had um, music charts on how much your music was being listened to. Because you can download all your songs on there. And the major labels were using it too, right? The usual jerk-offs, right? So when uh, the charts got filled with the indie bands... The majors were getting pissed off and wanted to kick us all off. But our charts were like, we were all in the top 100 was all the bands that I was just finding out about. You know, there's Electric Frankstein, but there was like Rocket City Riot, uh, Pulpit Red, um, bands from Sweden, bands from all over the world. And we all got together and we were all listening to, while we were all at work, we would listen to the playlist and that made everybody move up right when you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people eventually became thousands because so many bands told other bands how great mp3.com is so it was doing what facebook makes believe it does now right because facebook doesn't do music charts and all that stuff if it did like spotify right it was like spotify and facebook mixed together well, for Net one thing, the, not to cut you off, but the big difference is uh, mp3.com um, during its heyday cared about independent arts. Facebook hates the independent right. arts. Absolutely. I mean, it's almost impossible to market yourself on Facebook in any way, shape or form because nobody sees your content. And that's just the sad reality. But anyway. it's on purpose. Facebook is so big that they have people who get jobs there that are representing someplace else and with a hidden agenda. So they don't even know that their own employees are doing things. Cause if you ask Zuckerberg, he goes, oh, I didn't know that. We don't do that. And he goes, yeah, what your employees do. Right. So anyway, mp 3 com became very popular for that almost two years. And it was where you can find new music. And then there was the, major label charts too but they weren't even getting anywhere the amount of hits that all the indie charts were getting i mean there was indie rap and indie hip-hop um uh, i didn't really listen to it um there was indie grunge you know all kinds of stuff but the indie rock and roll punk um was the big deal and then um this magazine somebody did a two-page article about now i understand electric frankenstein they go i couldn't understand the guy said because i listened to them i'm like yeah so what you know they're okay it's a rock band and then he goes i couldn't understand why they're giving away all their music as mp3s so while i was working i'd put on an album then i listened to another one and another one and he goes i couldn't stop i really love their songs and they were playing in the background while I was working all day long, all week long. And he goes, I finally understood. And took two pages of this explanation. He goes, I finally understood what they were doing. 
it was a major marketing where they're like letting you hear their songs for free but it makes you buy their CDs. And he said, I went, I bought every CD used or not from eBay, Amazon of them because I wanted to play whenever I wanted to at that point, or I wanted to look at the record covers because they had great record covers. But see, that was, that was uh, the beauty of mp3.com that you can make lifelong fans. So today, many of our original fans were from mp3.com. They're still with us. And then all the bands that I started, everybody, after mp3.com, what happened? They got bought out by somebody who was representing the major labels, but they were making believe they weren't. It was like a company within a company. And then they closed it. They bought it and they closed it at its heyday when it was doing the best. So it splintered and Magnatune came out of that. It's a company that um, licensed music from cool bands all over the world to be uh, play in the cafeteria or play, um, you know, in the hospitals, whatever. Or um, So then TuneCore, right, which is much bigger. And uh, they play your music on 65 streaming platforms all over the world for 50 bucks a year. So, and then you don't even have to pay the 50 bucks because it comes from your royalties. So um, we make like $800 a year, sometimes a month on uh, TuneCore, but all that came from the mp3.com. And so then after mp3.com ended, the bands were still talking to each other. They go, what do we do now? I go, oh, why don't I put out a compilation series? I go, I'm, I'm, and Electro Frank is on 72 different compilations. It's, they must still be good for um, showing people your music. So I went around to different labels, explained the concept that I wanted to do, um, like the best of um, high energy rock is what I started calling it. It's punk rock and hard rock mixed together. So um, I guess punk rock with lead guitar, right? So um, then that just finally found uh, TP Records and they did the first six and they mm -hmm. did it on vinyl and CD. Uh, they were telling me they were selling 3000 CDs a week um just to europe right and that's the thing it made all the american bands bind with the european bands and so the scandinavian bands wanted to hear american bands and we wanted to hear their bands so and and, and then i was discovering bands from all over costa rica um you know austria um south africa and um meanwhile i was also writing for um uh, hit list right yeah, and I was doing that. So you want to be a rock and roll star. And I did a year by year what you should do with your band, how to get popular. And mm -hmm. so bands bands would tell me, well, we were nowhere for three, four or five years. Then we, I brought your articles to the band and I said, listen, we have nothing to lose. It's either break up or do what this guy says. And he goes, boom. He goes, now we're really popping. <laughs> he goes, all we did was what you said to do. So major labels contact me and ask me if they could use the material to teach their bands what to do uh, when they were still signing rock bands, not anymore. And um, right. And then uh, indie labels were asking me. So that became a big deal. And that all became, was intertwined with mp3.com at the time. So, um, well, let, yeah, me, so then let, I, me, it, let me pause it real quick, just to give a, a context to the viewer. Uh, the, the series name is called a fistful of rock and roll. It was a 13 volume series, I believe, right? 13 volumes, yeah. the, first, the first one. First series, yeah. Yeah. And this was, um, I know I'm on volume four with my band at the time, The Graveyard School. So that came out in, I think, the year 2000, mm -hmm. volume four on CD and vinyl. So we're looking at like circa 1999, 2000. This series takes off. Um, each compilation has, you know, a fair number of bands. I think at least a dozen or so, you know, roughly on each each volume. Two dozen. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, it was a lot of stuff on, on these records. And it, it went really far. You had distribution through Caroline Records at the time. TP Records was a very active label in those days. I don't know what uh, Tony is doing now with TP, but... It's been quite a few years since I've heard anything from that from that scene. But at that time, TP was really 
putting out some interesting stuff. So it was a nice combination of factors working together. Um, so that was the series. Now, right. that was 1998 to 2008. Okay. And, Thank right. You. And then Victory picked it up and they did two. And then uh, I did two on all different labels because I wanted to spread it out, you know, and uh, I wanted the labels to be part of the story. Um, I mean, at the time, Victory still considered an indie label and he was happy to put out. It did very well. He was he was shocked himself, Tony, how well it did. So um, did I get paid? No. So uh, <laughs> I got a lot of free copies. I sold them. So mm -hmm. um, but they grew and grew and grew. So I was finding bands like everyone had well-known bands, medium level bands and unknown bands. And then a lot of big people like Mike Monroe and everything were giving me songs unreleased, mm -hmm. right? So I had all kinds of unreleased music on each one. So anybody any that was anybody was on the first series. And then it that grew because people who I meet people in their 30s go, oh, I was I, I have all those compilations when from when I was 15. So mm -hmm. I'm like, then that's just erupted because those uh, volumes made bands made people want to start their own bands so then the reason it stopped in 2008 because the world economy drop right and all these people that were in the bands were getting married having kids and they all stopped playing for a couple years right and they were getting jobs and all that baloney but meanwhile new bands were coming up and i was holding on to them and then i said I'm going to have to do a second series, um, you know? So I was getting labels to put them out. And uh, I, four of them are out on vinyl, but COVID put a big damper on the issuing of the records. So that was almost five years we lost. Um, and so there's even more bands now than ever before. And there's all these genres within genres now. So before it was all um, high energy rock. Well, now you got what people call high octane. Then you have people doing hardcore punk rock and roll. It's 80s hardcore mixed with hard rock. Mm. If you can imagine that. 80s hardcore with intros and leads and outros, right? And so there's a whole group of bands from Seattle doing that. Electro Frankenstein pretty much is what they're describing us down here in North Carolina is what we sound like now. And um, there's um, noise, rock and roll. <laughs> I have a, all of them on my comps. So there's so many um, sub genres now because, you know, when something grows, it gets little islands inside it. So uh, I think it's more fun than ever. I have, 24 volumes that I put together on my uh, computer. And, um, you know, I'm very frustrated. <laughs> Only the first four have come out. So they're coming out one by one. Um, I haven't tried to get new bands for the last couple of years, but, um, you know, I keep getting asked every day. So I'm going, to, I'm going to do 40, 50 volumes. I mean, maybe I, I you know, maybe I should whatever the pebbles are for or there's a huge amount of pebbles right now then he this, made a second series the second series the one that has the four volumes out so far that's okay. called a fistful more of rock and roll correct right yes and i'm band camp the first 16 of those are there um i could put all 24 but they're not mastered after volume 16 and I was listening to them. I go, I'm, I'll put them on anyway. Then I went, no. <laughs> it was one band song is real loud. One's really low. So um, some great songs, and I don't want people to miss them. Now, um, it's it's, in, it's still getting people saying it's totally inspiring. Um, there's a whole bunch of labels now that cater to the Fistful of Rock and Roll people, the audience. Um, they think they're calling it Savage Music for Savage People. <laughs> so... Um, and that's really making it into some my thing much bigger than I expected, but that's good. I mean, that's what I was hoping for. And, um, 
yeah, there's lots of people tell me they they can put all of them in their CD changer at a party and no one says, can you take this off? Everybody goes, what song is that? Who is that? What is that? What, what band is that? That's amazing. So I get a lot of that. People tell me, man, this is a total, because I was a DJ for three years on a college radio. So I know how to ride. So I put the songs so they're riding. You know, I put a blockbuster first and then I, go to punk rock then i go right to hardcore then i go right but it's still not totally hardcore totally punk rock it's still got the rock and roll trend thread through it so and it has all that in it and it's um continuing you know uh people want me to do a book uh i have a book all done about the history of rock of the punk rock and roll stuff and where it started and how it moved. Uh, I had somebody from Spain wrote me a whole fat chapter on the history of, of rock and roll from Spain. I asked all these people from all these different countries to do it for their country. Everybody says, yeah, and then they don't, you know? So I, I really don't know what to do because I don't want to discard the Spain chapter, mm -hmm. but I also want to have all the other chapters. So, I mean, there's Indonesia, there's Philippines, there's Turkey. There's so many countries that have a thriving rock and roll scene that people don't even know about. Even China has punk rock, you know? So it's, um, I think this put out the germ. So that started something called New Rock Revolution. And people were calling it the New Rock Revolution. And then new NME and uh, told their writers under no circumstance, the head guy, I don't know if he's still there. Under no circumstance are you going to ever mention the New Rock Revolution, mention that there's a, such a thing, and mention any of those things. If you write about the bands, you can't mention they're part of the New Rock Revolution. Because we we missed the boat on punk rock, and we lost a lot of advertising. We don't want to do that again. This is the letter they showed me, the writers showed me. So I'm wait, like... Wait, wait, whoa, whoa. So they lost advertising because they missed the punk revolution. So they're ignoring the new rock revolution? Yeah, because they said all their major label advertising. They lost a whole bunch um, when punk came because people didn't give a crap about what major label bands were coming out. They all wanted to know about all the indie bands. And again, there's all these indie labels, you know, Ghost Highway, Deadbeat, um, Savage Magic, all these people putting out all this stuff and so many more, like 50 more. And they're not they don't have the money to that it costs to put an ad in enemy so enemies like no 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 this is gonna you know the whole industry is gonna be out of our hands again that's what that's what the guy that i read the letter myself and i go wow he actually sent this out to all the writers I thought that was crazy yeah it goes is. to show my power we have <laughs> Well, about the, the comps themselves, um, I'll admit I haven't heard all of them because there are a lot of them out there. But what I can tell the viewer is I, I, I own quite a few of the first series and I own a couple of the newer one too. And it's not like a comp where, I mean, let's be honest, there are some comps out there that are kind of tossed together and the quality is is very hit and miss depending on how many bands you have all the fistful of rock and roll releases are solid meaning that all the bands are are decently to very well produced the songs are good there's a cohesion between the bands although it's different styles you could imagine these bands on the same bill you know there's a right. connection between a lot of it so i would tell people because i was on a lot of comps in the 90s a lot of comps and I was happiest to be on a fistful of rock and roll volume four because it was the most well put together compilation. There was a lot of care that was into it. The bands were awesome on that volume. It was us again, the graveyard school, uh, degeneration with, I think that was the lineup with Todd youth prohibition right. song, um, high school sweethearts, American Heartbreak, which was guys from Jet Boy and Exodus, <laughs> right. um, you know, okay. and funny Helicopters enough, Helicopters and Becker Babies and yeah. you name it, 
or on it, uh, Turbo Negro. Um, right. You know, labels were giving me songs. So some bands would say to me, how did that song get on your comp? I go, oh, uh, Kozik gave it to me. From uh, He said, uh, this is important. You help promote our music. So, yeah. yeah. And, and a lot it- of labels started from listening to the comps. They yeah. wanted to put out the band. Like Dead Beat puts out just about every band on the comps. Uh, like he's listens to them all, sees which one he likes, contacts the bands right away. So he's got all the bands from Italy. He's got everything mm-hmm. on there. Now what I see the big difference when uh, how it grew in Europe, Italy had maybe three bands on the first series. I, there's 30 on the new series. There's mm-hmm. 700 bands from Australia and there and, and and 700 from Sweden, right? Just Sweden alone. I mean, if you just take this Gothenburg, there's there's got to be like a hundred bands from Gothenburg. I'm like, what? Did it give you a a card when you graduate high school and say, here's your union card to be in the band? <laughs> That's really- so, but they get government sub- subsidies, right? The government pays for their apartments and um, pays for their recording stuff. In Scandinavia, unlike here, uh, music that's for bums. <laughs> oh, you're an artist? Fuck you. Yeah. 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 But I gotta tell and- you, Sal, this this compilation series has legs on a personal level. I had Chad Wells on a few uh, episodes ago from the uh, Jackalopes, you know, and yeah, he's on there. About his experiences on the series last year. Handsome Dick Manitoba played up here in New Hampshire. Um, and Michael Butler was his bass player. Michael Butler was from American Heartbreak. So when I met, met up with, with Dick and, and the fellas, I was talking to Michael, like, yeah, we were on the same record 24 years ago. He's like, oh, yeah, we were, you know. So there are these connections globally, you know, even from people who were there kind of at the beginning, you know, volume four and earlier, um, all these years later, almost a quarter century later. You know, people are still talking about these comps. And we, we should definitely talk about the cover art and the oh, art yeah. and, and all these great releases you've put out. Well, like Electric Frankenstein, the cover art was a, very important. It was like a member of the band. And the same as the comps. I had anybody, anybody do them all. And the first series and then the second series, everybody asking me if they could do them. Um, everybody volunteers to give me, I don't, I only paid a few people cause they were destitute, but the rest, they go, no, no, don't pay me. Just give me the free record. I'd rather have the record. So, um, that's real good. I mean, uh, every cover is wild looking. There's no, there's no junk. Everything's wild looking just like the music. And I mean, there's very inspiring. I mean, they look at the music. It's inspiring. I mean, listen to the music and look at the covers. It's inspiring. I mean, if you're 15, you pick it up, you're like, it's this, right? So that's the things that people told me they experienced when they first saw the compilation, especially when you see a pile of them. Oh, I wanted to say something. I I was going to say it before I forgot. I was in um, Wowsville in New York before they moved to Germany. And um, Lenny Kay was there. Hmm. And he was looking through and uh, they showed him, he saw my fistful comps and, and he said, what are these? And then they pointed to me, he goes, oh yeah, I'm doing like a, a retrospective of all the best bands of my time. And he goes, I wish I did that. I did the Nuggets. Yeah, big deal. It's old music you can get anywhere. He goes, I, I had so many demo tapes. I had so many cassettes of bands that were like the Stooges, like all that stuff nobody knows I lost them. And he goes, they're all gone. If I did what you did, he goes, they would have preserved all this great music. So this is a very important function that you're doing. He told me this is, this is preserving for history, the best bands of your generation and, and, and under, right? Every, every, there's new comps coming out, coming out. So it's now, uh, you know, now it's, it is 15 year olds that has to be on the comps, you know, 15, 16, 17. So the people are younger and younger now. People were in their 40s that were on the first series for the most part. And then uh, the 20-year-olds came, but now it's really um, gotten to the younger kids that got inspired by it. 
Well, I, I think it's great, too, that this series, um, in, in the current context, the ones you've put out, you know, the, the second series especially, you know, those are done now in this internet, this full internet age that we're in. I mean, back right. in the year 2000, people sort of kind of used it, but it wasn't like what it, what it is now. And the problem is, yes, there's great music everywhere, but... If you go on Facebook or any of these social media platforms, it's like being hit with the fire hose. There's like too much to take in. You don't know where to go. This streamlines and filters it so you know, you know, here are X number of bands who we know you're going to be into. We've done the groundwork for you. We've done the discovery for you. Get this volume. This is going to be jam-packed with exactly what you're into. So, um yeah. That's a nice thing. Even even these days where, yeah, music is everywhere. Yeah, that's the problem. You got to kind of bring it down and give people in bands the right spotlight. And that's exactly what this series did back then and is doing now. So people told me they it's the who's who of uh, the new rock. So yeah. they want that's why they want to be on the compilations. Every time I ask them, they go, oh, thank you so much. You know, I really wanted to be on the comps. I have almost every one. And I'm like, well, your music sounds like it, <laughs> right? It sounds like you have almost every one. So, you know, I get some rockabilly bands want to be, and I go, I can't, or, or 60s garage bands. I go, you guys have your own compilation series, mm -hmm. you know? This is for what you would say it's rock and roll. Punk rock is rock and roll, but it's not for gutter punk. I don't have that. Mm -hmm. So if this sounds like the casualties, it doesn't fit. But things that are, you know, what what's punk rock and roll? 70s based, right? Punk from the 70s and hard rock from the 70s. Yeah. And that mushroomed into, look at that gigantic scene in Australia and in Sweden and uh, the rest of you know, England. Oh, England has a lot of bands, but no place to play. So that's the other problem. So, Well, where would you put America? in that stew at this point you know how would you how would you compare where we are right now to so many other parts of the country parts of the world that you've been checking out well when i first did it it was red hot and every major city had a load of bands and they got older and blah 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 we got marriage age and then there's a new crop which was about five years ago um and now it's changing still but our country is like still like the big melting pot so everything that's here is spread out so much, you know, I would have bands like from Israel. I have, I have them on the comp and the genders and they're like, uh, Oh, we want to tour the United States. And I go, okay, how many records did you sell in the United States? No, none. And I go, you can't do that. And he goes, why? If, a, if an American band came to Israel, there'll be a thousand people at the show. I go, yeah, but <laughs> Do you know how big the United States is? I go, 50 states, major cities in every state, major scenes in every state, third, first level scene, second level scene, third level scenes, then the whole issue of uh, travel. And I said, if you sold 300 singles, that means five people in every state have your record? I go, you can't do it. And they did it anyway. And then I met up with them in New York, went to their New York show. He goes, you were totally right. I'm so pissed off. This was like a big, giant struggle. I go, I, I told you. I go, get popular first. I go, I wrote all those articles and in, in, in that magazine. And the point of the magazine articles was get popular. Once you're popular, you have power, right? And money comes after, right? Everybody worries about getting paid. But nowadays, everybody's since Spotify, basically. I mean, I can't believe that that guy makes three billion dollars a year by not paying anybody. And then um, Bandcamp, they give three thousand dollars, three million, three billion dollars. They gave away three billion dollars of royalties to all their band, three billion. And so you have a three billion dollar being kept by a somebody who doesn't appreciate it which is why neil young was so pissed off and so many other people there's also sound exchange when all this stuff started happening they needed to collect royalties from the internet right so the bad side of um 
what do you call that word? Affirmative action. The bad side of it is they gave a, the Obama administration gave a contract to sound exchange, right? To collect all the royalties. And we all found out they're keeping 50% of the royalties. And now it's all black run, right? Which should be irrelevant, but they're driving around in limos, going to all these parties and whose money? They're taking 50% royalty. And then that you get half of what you're supposed to get. So Depeche Mode and all these bands said, know what you do? Keep it. They go, fuck you. I don't want any of those mo that money. You can go to hell. If you are going to keep 50% royalty, go to hell. You keep it. So there was a big thing going on with all these major bands telling them to drop debt. Because they wanted every band in the world to register with them and stuff like that. <clears throat> you know, I get about 20 bucks from them because I'm getting pennies from them. Pennies for things. And now they have mandatory licenses now. So if a, if a company wants your songs, they get a mandatory license and they take it. Mm -hmm. Take it. And then uh, you get paid through these people who suck most of it out and give you a sardine right well so. i i checked my my spotify royalties right before i connected with you actually mm -hmm. you want to fucking guess <laughs> let, let, me put the, let me put it this way i bought dinner tonight on my spotify royalties nah. which is fine but you know compared to what the sales could be if there was a, a, a more uh, uh, artist friendly model, it would be a different story. Again, it's made for the major labels who are going to sell in excess. And then the major labels are still getting the bulk of the income from Spotify, which is the same problem. Why did MP3.com start? Why did we do all this to get out of that rut right. and, uh, and create a new rock revolution? So now the majors don't care. Now they do use TikTok. And they sell a song at a time. So it's like uh, the 1890s when you have player piano music and you're selling sheet music, right? And uh, that's it. That's what it is. And for them, uh, I don't think it's going to work. I think it's going to die out for them. And nothing is dying out in the stuff that I'm doing with all these bands. It's continuing and still growing. So... Um, yeah, it's, it's 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 a difficult story with the digital stuff. And then all the artists are talking to me about AI, how it's ripping them off. You know, I asked somebody, who does all your art? I go, that's amazing art. It looks like the style of, of people who did my fiscal comps. And they go, oh, it's all AI. I'm like, mm -hmm. it's stealing from these artists that I know. And people are like going, duh, he uses AI, he uses AI. And I'm like, ah, you know, I'm Facebook. I'm like, it's nice stuff. I mean, well, the stuff that looks like it, I don't care about the airbrush looking stuff. That's what AI mostly does. But yeah. some of it really looks like illustrators did it by hand. And uh, that's crazy. That's, I go, how? I mean, it's just stealing people's ideas and then mm -hmm. rebuilding. And same as the AI photos, all those poor actresses, there's all this phony AI photos of them on Facebook and, you know, in, risky looking shots that they never would have taken pictures of you know um what's her name the girl from black widow um scarlett johansson how many nude pictures of her there are that you know she didn't do because her ass is not that big and neither are her boobs she's got a petite body and they show all these things i go why are you doing that to that poor girl i mean like why would you want to do that yeah. you know what why would you want to do it? so it's the same thing People going, well, artists are saying to me, wait till they do AI music, which they already do, and oh, they're yeah. going to just copy your style. And I go, well, who's going to buy it? Not my fans, not fans of rock and roll. They're going to be like, it sounds generic, which it does, right? Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, we we can go on an entire five-hour discussion just on AI, man. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it affects me across the board. It affects me in journalism. It affects right. me in editing. It affects me in what you know what I do musically. It potentially affects me with even this. So it's like everything I enjoy doing now is at risk of being replaced. The fuck is this? You know. It, well, they're gonna eventually replace people then because 
those billionaires don't need us. If they make us all dirt poor uh, and we all forced to work at McDonald's. Well, McDonald's stopped hiring people. They have machines doing everything. So McDonald's is losing so much money. They never lost this much money before. Now that they got, you know, what's that called? Kiasik. Right. People go, oh, there's no human interaction. I don't I don't I don't need their food for that much money. I can go to a restaurant. Right. So. Yeah, then they're all shooting themselves in the foot because greed is always its own worst enemy. Right. Greed is always going to never look ahead. Greed only looks at like, how much can I take advantage of things right now? And then, then you start imploding. Right. That's what, and this is the issues that we were talking about when mp3.com started and uh, all the bands were getting together and creating the whole uh, fistful of rock thing was that was music, but now um, that was digital files now, but bands took it over and used it. Now I'm getting a uh, music consult consultants talking to me saying you should make an AI twin and let take over the AI thing from them by making the AI twin do all your busy work. I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to look into this. He said, I made you a video. I explained it all, how to do it step by step. And um, I'm like, okay, I haven't had a chance to look at it. I'm like, okay, that turns the tables. That just automates my j busy stuff. But what does that mean? Automates the sending out press kits sending out you know we'll see i'll see what he said but he goes yeah 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 you take it over and you use it against them and then it's then it i'm like okay so this this guy uh he call, he's called the baker um he made his parents bakery business into a multi-million dollar company in england and then he was bored of that and he wanted to do something in the music business. Now he's a very logical person. So he did a lot of research with major labels and he had got one of his bands signed to a major label and they made a lot of money, but who made the most money, the label. And then he found out that it's a trickle down thing and only a small percentage uh, of the bands at the top make all the money. Uh, all these bands at the bottom don't get paid. So that whole model was from the 1950s and they still use it. So he did another band, the Huna, and completely made them in one year go from zero to doing 200,000 people at their shows in England. And then the major labels came and convinced the band, he didn't do shit for you. It's you guys. It's your music. You don't need them. Come to us. We have big distribution. Well, guess what? Everything collapsed for that band. They were like playing 300. If they get a lot of people, it's 300 seaters. Mm -hmm. So this guy had a whole system, a whole way. When I first was creating my articles, he was just starting to do the research and we were talking. And I said, well, some of what you're saying overlaps with what I was saying in my articles and uh, and how to make it if you're an independent band. And uh, he created a whole process, a whole system. Uh, you know, major labels put out a whole propaganda smear campaign against the guy. And now he's trying to recover from it. Um, but he's doing this whole thing on Facebook to help bands. And you can pay for him to uh, run the business of for you, of your band, and how to get somewhere. For me, as Electra Frankstein, I don't need it because I already have the whole process and I already have the fan base. So if you start from nothing and you need to do something, I think it's worth it. But he mostly works with what what do we call indie bands? What is that? That sound, you know, Foo Fighters Jr. Um, right, right. You know, Bell Jam Jr. That's the indie sound. Um, there were some great bands in the 80s and 90s that were indie, right? Um, but that I wouldn't call them rock and roll, right? But they were good. Um must have been a hundred different ones that don't exist anymore. So that's what these people seem to want to do because they think that appeals to the most people. Like they try to appeal to teenage girls first. So I, am I appealing to teenage girls? No. 
Yeah, yeah, we're both we're both winning big in the teen girl market. Actually, yeah. there's three of us doing it. There's you, me, and Taylor Swift. Yeah, winning shit. <laughs> there are some that like us. I mean, of course, because they like rock because of their parents, right, or their friends. But um, that's the one thing cool, you know, that all these people during COVID were. I sold out of Electrifying Time Records and the and the first Fistful series because they were buying records their parents were missing. Mm. And they were filling gaps and they listened to their parents' records. So that whole COVID thing being at home, the lockdown made so many kids convert to rock and roll. You know, so many kids. I mean, I must, I used to get tons of emails from, couldn't keep up with them from people saying, I just discovered this kind of music. <laughs> And they go, it's fun. They go, it's not depressing. The Nirvana is depressing. You know, we don't want to kill ourselves. We want to enjoy our life. I'm like, yes, rock and roll is about enjoying your life, right? Yes. It's about sex, about the old in and out. <laughs> yes, always, always has been, always will be. So, where can people find out um, about these compilations? I think you, if you, it's a good place to start is Bandcamp. Go to Bandcamp, look up a fistful of rock and roll and a fistful more of rock and roll. And you can hear the whole first series and you can buy them. And the whole, the what's what I put out so far is 16 volumes on Bandcamp. Um, on vinyl and CD, um, you got to go through the labels that put them out. So the first four. Um, so everything's there. You just look them up. And then there's a fistful of rock and roll uh facebook group and there's bands from all over i can't even keep up with them there's so many new bands i don't have time to listen to them i'm gonna have to in order to keep putting new bands on the comp but i'm up to volume 25 and i can't stop you know it's not fair to any of the bands and not fair to myself i go listen to this holy shit this band is fucking incredible like who the hell are these guys right now i discovered some new band called life lifeguard and it's like 15 year olds that, that play rock and roll sonic youth hmm. and i'm like these guys are amazing musicians they did a cover in the city but it's noise rock rock and roll and i'm like wow you know do you know what the di dialectical materialism is and uh um uh philosophy it's one of the one of the commies came came up with it there's the thesis there's the antithesis, and then comes the synthesis. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happening over and over and over. Like punk is the antithesis of something else, but it's a synthesis of something else. So all these, like I would say this band that I was just talking about, they're a synthesis of punk rock and roll and noise rock, because there's a whole big noise rock resurgence too. right? There's, I went to the Cat's Cradle over here and I saw a band from San Francisco, I go, this is as good as any band from New York was in the 80s when my old band thing used to play. So it's things are promising. I think things are on the way, continue going up and people are, are always curious to listen to new, the new stuff. People, a lot of people tell me, I'll get your comps and then I'll look up each band and I'll buy everything they did. <laughs> and, and then bands tell me, once I'm on the comp, sales go up. Yeah. Well, I thank you for bringing my band at the time onto that series way back when. I appreciate the fact you're still doing this series. Um, you've always been very keenly aware of what the cool thing is musically. So I appreciate the fact that you're still in the game doing that. Um, I will put the links up that you mentioned in the video description. Anyone watching this, check this stuff out and go back to the beginning, volume one, way back when, and work your way through this. You will not be disappointed. You will find tons of great bands uh, and you'll really open your ears to some amazing music. So um, I know you have some other commitments uh, coming up relatively soon. So I do want to thank you for coming back on. And uh, we should mention, too, Electric Frankenstein is touring Japan. Right. October. October, the from the 11th to the 20th, we're doing shows with the adolescents. And um, one, one great band that I like, uh, Dead Vikings, is going to play one of the shows from mm -hmm. Kobe, where, where they're from. And before that, we're the 20th, we're in Indianapolis. And the 21st, we're at the 
in Chicago at the Liars Club. So we oh, got cool. those September, yeah. So, so that's, that's the, yeah. And Jamie Pena is gonna play from uh, Chemical People. Nice. So he's nice. doing a he's lead guitar for both the tours. Our singer is a lead guitar player. So at practice, he plays lead guitar, and he's really great. I mean, everybody now in electronic sound is really the best we've ever been, and the songs make me giggle at practice and laugh at how great they are. And I go, listen to this fucking song. It's so fucking good. <laughs> so I I really hope everybody else is going to think. So now we're like, oh, we better not, we can't put out the demos because we need that bam impact. So we're going to have to record. If anybody knows Fat Records, tell them we want to be on their label because we looked and looked and looked and researched and the, the only people I think that can handle what we what we need that Victory used to do would be Fat Records. Mm. I don't think Epitaph. I don't. Everybody told me never trust Epitaph, so don't do anything with them. So we'll see. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll certainly be in touch. Well, before then, but I hope that is a great time when it when it hits the road. And um, as always, Sal, great talking to you. Um, come back again. You know, right. and uh, we'll, we'll 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 have no problem thinking of something to talk about. I'm sure. There's well about the new album. Oh, you're going to be a guest on one of the songs. Yes, yes. It's called Napalm Walker. <laughs> nice. So we we were starting to do. I go put a ministry beat to this, and then my brother goes, "Why don't we just get Joel and just do?" And then um, we want to do Maggot SS again too. We never talked about that ever. That was with uh, Howie, but yeah. um. Uh, Roy from Soulfly played drums on that and we want to record more songs. I'm buying this really great great keyboard because I play keyboard in, in that band and uh, I have the money I'm just waiting for Guitar Center to make me a good offer. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, well, I'm down. Um, I'll have my people reach out to your people. We'll <laughs> negotiate and um, I will gladly go to the studio and uh, bash out with EF again. All right. Great. Sal, for, for the interview. Always a pleasure, my friend. I'll see you soon. Thank you.